Remember, Niner 6 Tango, maintain 2,000 on final approach now. Do not acknowledge further transmissions if no transmission received for a five second period. Abandon the radar approach. Proceed direct to the outer compass locator. Execute an ILS approach. Contact Los Angeles Tower 118.9er. Niner 6 Tango, turn right, heading 235. 235, new heading, maintain 2,000. Six and one half miles from touchdown, turn right, heading 245, 245, new heading. November 9 or 6 Tango, turn to land, runway 25 left, wind 250 degrees at seven knots. Five and three quarter miles from touchdown, 245, the heading. Glide path interception at one half mile. 245, the heading. Five and one half miles from touchdown, no one, glide path to get normal rate of descent. 245, the heading, passing the Los Angeles ILS outer compass locator on glide path. 245, the heading on course. Four and three quarter miles from touchdown on glide path on course. 245, the heading. Turn left, heading 243. 243, new heading. Four and one half miles from touchdown on glide path. Three and one half miles from touchdown, 15 feet above glide path, adjust descent. Turn right, heading 249 or 249 or new heading on glide path. Turn left, heading 247. On glide path, 247 the heading. Lined up with the left edge of the runway, passing the middle marker, take over, complete your landing, contact Los Angeles Tower, 118.9. An airport is busy, fascinating. Excited people hurrying to travel to far off places. The hustle and bustle of planes arriving and departing. But in the background, there is a kind of drama enacted here that few people ever see. It holds a fascination all its own. Clearance delivery, Niner 6 Tango. ATC clears, Twin Bonanza, 6 Niner 6 Tango. To the Denver Airport, via Victor 208, Victor 8. Cross Wilmington intersection at or above 6,000, maintain 8,000. Propellers. Set for takeoff. Magnetos. Check. Freedom and travel of flight controls. Check. Altimeter clock and gyro. Check. Doors and windows closed and locked. Check. Landing gear circuit breakers. Check. Fuel boost on. Check. OK, we're ready to roll. Los Angeles Tower, Niner 6 Tango's ready. Niner 6 Tango, Los Angeles Tower, runway 25 left, clear to take off. Contact departure control, 124.3 after takeoff. Los Angeles departure control, Twin Bonanza 6 Niner 6 Tango's airborne 25 left. Twin Bonanza Niner 6 Tango, Los Angeles departure control, radar contact crossing the shoreline. Maintain heading 250 for radar vector to Victor 208. Report leaving 7000. Hello there. Welcome aboard 696 Tango. Your co pilot, I'm happy to say, is my son Jim. I think maybe, Jim, this might be a good time to tell just what's happening here in the cabin. As you can see, we're flying through heavy overcast. We can't see more than a few yards, so we now have to use our instruments to tell us where we are and what the aircraft is doing. 
this sort of instrument flight is necessary any time visual reference is lost. This loss of vision can be caused by haze, bad weather, or even just a dark night. The instruments are controlling our flight path automatically, but it's still the pilot's responsibility to program the autopilot, monitor the instruments, and be prepared to take over manually. We are also being tracked and assisted by men on the ground Bonanza, using Niner, radar. Six tango, Los Angeles, Niner six tango is out of 7,000. Twin Bonanza Niner six tango, Roger. Your position six miles west of Wilmington intersection. Contact Los Angeles Center radar 126.0 now. This kind of flying is a far cry from the old days, believe me. In the early days, the airplane was more a toy than a tube. Barnstorming pilots risked their lives and thrilled all of us with the air circus. Early day pilots flew entirely by their senses. Sight, balance, direction. Seat of the pants flying, they called it. And they were good at it. There wasn't much they couldn't do with an airplane, except fly in the clouds. Whenever they tried, something went wrong. And usually, someone was killed. Of course, those early planes didn't have the instruments we now know the pilots needed. Today, the law demands that every plane be instrument equipped but some so-called weather accidents still happen. Why? Well, let's investigate one of these accidents. A private pilot and three friends were returning home at dusk. As darkness began to fall, it became more difficult to see clouds, and suddenly they were actually in the clouds. The plane was reported missing, and a search was started. I see. Colonel Richards. I wonder if I might ask you a few questions just to hear for a moment. How long has been has the search and rescue mission been operating? About 72 hours now. It uh, started last Monday morning. Uh, how many planes have been involved in the search? Well, 35 planes. Planes from the Air Force, Civil Air Patrol, uh, the United States Navy, and the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Aereo Squadron. This is a difficult thing I know for you to answer, Colonel, but what do you think the chances are of uh, survival for these fellows? Well, of course, uh, we don't like to take any a negative attitude on a thing like this, but from past experience and searches in this type of weather, this type of, of terrain, this period of the year, a white plane on a white background of snow, it's very difficult. We participated in the search and shared some of the frustrations of the Colonel and his men. Unfortunately, the plane was hidden beneath a blanket of snow, and the search finally had to be called off. Later, the snow melted, and the wreckage was discovered. Yes, four men died here. Needlessly so. We call this a typical weather accident. A pilot, a good one, but not qualified, not equipped for the kind of weather he found himself in. This plane was actually torn apart in the air by the violent maneuvers of a totally disoriented pilot. Now, keeping in mind what you have just seen, I want you to listen to a tape recording of another pilot who was not prepared for what he encountered. This one is flying a well-equipped twin-engined airplane, but he too is not an instrument pilot. He will lose control of the aircraft within 30 seconds after he enters the clouds. Oh, <laughs> 
Lost radar contact. At that moment, the plane crashed and the pilot and his two passengers were killed. We at Moody Institute of Science are deeply concerned about these crashes because we're convinced that most of them are completely unnecessary. Why then did they happen? We've studied the problem from many angles. Modern aircraft and instrument design, the nature of the so-called graveyard spiral, and the many human factors involved. We have a growing conviction that the most basic part of the problem is a widespread misconception concerning the human balance mechanism. Now, if you're a pilot, what you will see and hear in the next few minutes could well be the best life insurance you could have. Jim? Now, we all know that we can walk about with our eyes shut and maintain our balance. But did you know that a pilot can't fly with his eyes shut? With his eyes shut, he can't tell whether he's flying straight, turning, climbing, or diving. Oh, and I know there are some that won't agree with that statement. Many feel that all that we need to maintain our balance is the inner ear sense. But this can be a very dangerous misconception. The subject for our demonstration is a gymnast. He has a highly developed sense of balance and sense of direction. We're going to blindfold Don so that he will have to rely on just the information coming from his inner ears to try and tell us what's happening. Are you ready? Yes. I'm turning to the right. 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 Still turning to the right. Now I'm slowing down. I've begun to slow down, slowing down. Slowing down, slower, I've stopped. I'm stopped. Are you sure? Yes. Now I'm turning to the left, and this time faster. I'm turning to the left. Are you dizzy? No, I'm not dizzy. All right, take off the blindfold. Oh, boy, now I am dizzy. Look at those eyes. While Don's eyes were covered, without even knowing it, he lost contact with reality. The instant the blindfold was removed, there was a conflict between what he felt and what he saw that was so deep-seated that the mind simply could not resolve it, and the subject is incapacitated for some time. A careful look at the balance mechanism within the ear will show us why. The organ is made up of three interconnected canals, and it's filled with a fluid. This is a model of just one canal. We use the red ball so that you can tell when the fluid is moving. This represents a sensing hair, and there are thousands of these. Even a slight motion disturbs the sensors. As we start a turn, the fluid momentarily lags due to its inertia. The sensors bend, and turning cues are transmitted to the brain. But this is where the pilot can get into real trouble. Notice that the fluid is catching up with the canal. And when the speed of the fluid and the speed of the canal are the same, the sensing hairs are erect, and we think we're stopped. Now stop the canal, and the fluid rushes on, bending the sensors in the opposite direction. And we think we're turning the other way, even though we're not turning at all. Obviously, our sense of balance must involve something more than just the inner ear, and it does. Our balance is made up of three senses, the inner ear, vision, and the proprioceptive sense, or the sense of movement and position coming from within the body. The inner ear, then, is just one part of an integrated system. And as we have seen, it can't function properly by itself. To be able to fly, a pilot must have a visual reference that will override the false sensations coming from his other senses. The instrument pilot 
has this visual override. He can see because he has the instruments, which for him provide an even more precise reference than another pilot would have flying in clear weather. Now it is true that all pilots have and at times use instruments in flight. But some have the mistaken idea that this makes them instrument pilots. The thing they don't realize is that when flying in clear air, even though they're concentrating on the instruments, their visual override is coming from outside the airplane. Remember the pilot involved in that first crash? He had been practicing instrument flight for some time. Listen to the words of the second pilot. Before a pilot can fly solely by reference to instruments, he has to develop a unique skill that will allow the instruments to become a substitute for the normal visual reference. And he has to have a faith in those instruments that becomes a way of life. If he feels like he's turning and the instruments tell him he's flying straight, he believes the instruments. And then his vision overrides the false sensations so that he isn't even conscious of them. This allows him to fly with complete safety in conditions that would kill the non-instrument pilot. All airline and military pilots are instrument pilots, and they're flying all over the world in all kinds of weather with the highest degree of safety. If we could expect any man to be an exception to the rules regarding instrument flight, it would be one of the astronauts. Mentally and physically, they are the finest. Let's see what astronaut John Glenn has to say about instrument flight. Well, we run into the same disorientation problems in space flight from the operations of the inner ear that uh, any private pilot runs into in normal everyday flying. Uh, what we found is that we, we have to rely on our instruments, have complete faith in them, just as a, a private pilot must come up to the time when he makes his decision when he's going into bad weather, whether he relies on his own senses or whether he uh, switches over and relies on the instruments. Uh, We've learned, of course, uh, through many years of experience, we must have faith in our, our instruments. Colonel, it's interesting to hear you mention faith. There are some today who feel that faith is old-fashioned and that somehow scientific knowledge has made faith unnecessary. Is this your experience? No, I, quite the opposite, I think. I think uh, faith is even more necessary today than it's ever been. We have faith in the instruments. We have faith in the, the forces that are working the compass that we can't see or feel. That we have faith in it, and uh, we've both staked our lives many times on it. Over the past years, we have used 9-6 Tango to photograph subjects which, without a plane, would be most difficult. Such as these ancient ruins of Tikal, deep in the jungles of Guatemala, or this work in the Arctic, or here in Africa. We've flown in bad weather in nearly every country of the world. Going left, turn right five degrees. So well above the glide path, uh, passing through the southeast gap at the present time. You're well clear of high ground. Hong Kong Tower, 696 Tango, clearance. Uh, ATC clears 696 Tango to Taipei via Green 8, Red 3. Our experience has been that instrument flying is reliable, trustworthy, and safe. Of course, there are a few places in the world where air traffic control just isn't available. We're now flying into one of them, the heart of the vast Libyan desert. We're hundreds of miles from civilization searching for a ghost bomber, a plane that has come out of the past to tell an unforgettable story of the need for faith in the instruments. There she is now, the mystery ship, the Lady Be Good. Discovery of the Lady Be Good triggered one of the most baffling investigations in military history. Air Force records revealed that the plane and her crew had disappeared on their first combat mission. Finding her here, more than a thousand miles from her target, and exactly the opposite direction from her base seemed impossible. Yet there could be no question. This was the Lady Be Good. Major Robertus, the story of the Lady Be Good certainly is one of the real sagas of World War II. I understand that uh, you made the first flight out here. Oh, that's right, I did, Doctor. 
And uh, what did you find at that time? What was the condition of the plane? Well, I would say that the condition of the Lady Be Good at that time was considerably different than you see it today. Uh, all the glass was in place, the gun all in place and fully loaded, and of course all the propellers were on. It was known that the Lady had reached the target area near Naples and had headed for her base at Benghazi, low on fuel. For 17 years, it was assumed that the plane ran out of fuel somewhere over the Mediterranean. Finding a plane that had been low on fuel 442 miles past her base was puzzling indeed. But the fate of the crew became an even greater mystery. From the condition of the wreckage, it was determined that the crew had bailed out just before the crash. But then they seemed to have vanished without a trace. Finally, after more than a year, the bailout point was discovered. This parachute harness was discarded by a member of the crew. The exposed edges were cut by sharp blowing sand. The rest looks practically new. This empty flare shell was found on the desert. Lieutenant Waravka's body was discovered nearby. Perhaps he was the fortunate one. His chute failed to open. But what about the other men? It was felt they could not have gotten far. Daytime temperatures were at least 135 to 140 degrees. The experts said they couldn't have walked more than 50 miles. Purely by accident, five bodies were finally discovered here, an incredible 78 miles from the bailout point. Let me read from a diary found beside one of the bodies. Thursday the 8th, hit sand dunes, very miserable. Continuous blowing of sand. Everyone now very weak. Thought Sam and Moore were all done. Lamott's eyes are gone. Everyone else's eyes are bad. And on Friday the 9th, Shelley, Rip, Moore, separate and try to go for help. Rest of us all very weak. It seems impossible that three men could have struggled on, but they did. Sergeant Ripslinger, referred to as Rip in the diary, fought on another 26 miles. Sergeant Shelley made it to this point. He had walked 114 miles. The body of Sergeant Moore has not yet been discovered. How far he got, we may never know. What quirk of fate was it that could have lured these men so far past their base and to their death in the desert? That night, as they returned from Naples, it seemed the crew had barely settled down for the long trip home when the instruments began acting strangely. The ADF needles swung around, indicating they had passed their base. Why, they weren't due home for hours. The crew was faced with a most difficult decision. They wanted to trust their instruments, but logic told them they must be wrong. They must be damaged, or maybe the enemy was sending out a decoy. They couldn't be home yet, so they continued on. The moment they lost faith in their instruments, their only hope was to spot the beacon light at Benghazi. So the pilot descended beneath the clouds and everyone started looking for a light they would never see. It was already many miles behind them. You see, there was another logical explanation for what happened that night. One that agreed perfectly with the instruments. At their particular altitude, they could have encountered an unusually high tailwind, which sent them whizzing past their base hours ahead of schedule. We now know this is what happened. The instruments were right. They were carefully tested after the plane was discovered in the desert. They were in perfect working order. On the instrument panel of every plane, and within every human heart and mind, these words should be deeply etched. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Remember those signals from the inner ear? Some of them are right, some are wrong. Slowing down. But without an accurate Lower. external standard of reference, I'm we can stopped. be completely wrong and not even know it. The same thing can apply to reason and logic. When faced with several equally logical alternatives, we can't just trust the way we feel. At such times, man must have an accurate standard of reference to guide him. 
instrument flying is based solidly on the principle that the pilot must have an accurate standard of reference outside himself, and he must have unwavering faith in that standard. An astronaut taking off on a space trip depends upon the laws used to compute his trajectory. He knows that they're not going to change before he can get back to Earth. This unshakable faith that the universe is governed by unchanging laws is the cornerstone of modern science. Now there is just one area where man still clings to the outmoded idea that there are no absolute laws to guide him. This is the moral and spiritual. An area where man is making little if any progress. The one area where he refuses to accept a standard of reference outside himself. Now the cornerstone for the vast global network of air traffic control is the faith of the pilot. Without this, everything becomes useless and the pilot is doomed. Remember that haunting, frantic cry for help? At that moment, the plane was being tracked on radar. All the instruments and electronic systems were working. The men on the ground were doing everything they could to help. But there was one all-important thing they could not do for the pilot. They couldn't believe for him. God has provided a complete system for our moral and spiritual guidance. He has given us a handbook which describes its unchanging standards. And here, too, faith is the cornerstone of the system. Without it, everything becomes useless. Now, faith is something you as an individual must supply. Oh, it may be encouraged by others, but in the last analysis, it's your personal responsibility. And once again, faith is the difference between life and death. For there is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And yet there's a wonderful alternative. It stems from the love of God for man. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Turn left heading 243, 243, new heading. The instrument pilot, recognizing his physical limitations, accepts by faith the guidance that is provided for him. In view of man's spiritual needs and limitations, is it not even more necessary for us to accept God's guidance? Turn left, heading two, four, Commit seven, thy way unto the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Astronauts are often accused of not being able to express themselves very well when they come back about really what it's like to be up in space. And I think that because when you look down at the Earth, you know, the word that comes to my mind is awesome. You just are so completely surrounded by the majesty of God and His creation. How beautiful are your works, O Lord. See how the Master Creator reveals Himself through the glorious miracle of creation, discover planet Earth. Be amazed by God's unique and diverse animal kingdom and realize the miracles of human life, the wonders of God's creation, three award-winning videos that present dramatic evidence of God's creative majesty, brought to you only by Moody Video. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. Space. Vast. Brilliant. Mysterious. A frontier which we have only begun to explore. 
marvel at the magnificence, thrill to the grand detail. There is a master creator, and this universe is the work of his hands. Join us for the unforgettable Journeys to the Edge of Creation, brought to you only by Moody Video. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. Brace yourselves for the awesome forces of God's creation. They're unstoppable, unforgettable, unpredictable. I knew that God was stronger than this storm could ever be and that he's the one I needed to look to to help me, help me through the storm. Come face to face with the thundering earth, the whirling winds, and the roaring waters. Meet the scientists who seek to understand the mysteries behind these powerful forces and learn how the master creator provides peace and strength in the storms of life. The Awesome Forces of God's Creation, a three-part series brought to you only by Moody Video. Get yours today. Inspiring scripture, beautiful hymns, and vivid nature scenes are combined as devotional videos that fill you with the peace and joy that can only come from God's Word. In His presence reminds you of God's faithfulness and unconditional love. Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store food away in barns, and yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Be encouraged and blessed by Worship the King. In His presence, Worship the King. Devotional favorites brought to you by Moody Video. Imagine you're a kid and you've just been given a science project. Do you A, consult every book you can find, B, go shopping, or C, visit your grandparents? Does anyone see my welding rods? Wow! Welcome to the Newton's Workshop, teaching science in ways you've never seen before. If I know Grandpa, we're bound for the edge of the solar system. Grandpa makes some pretty amazing gadgets, but God is the one who gets all the credit. God placed us here, and he gave us everything that we'll ever need to live and grow and enjoy his creation. Come on over to the Newton's Workshop. Moody Science Classics, a collection of timeless lessons of science and faith, featuring one of the most innovative teachers of our century, Dr. Erwin A. Moon. God's work as creator is not over. He stands ready today to perform for you his greatest creative miracle. Explore great mysteries. Discover through astounding demonstrations. Experience the marvels of nature. This is an actual human heart. Just a few hours ago, it was pumping blood through the body of a living human being. Amazing experiments, breathtaking photography, and God's Word brought together to bridge the gap between science and faith. Yours only through Moody Video.